Do you ever wake up and say to yourself, what a beautiful day to go for a run? <laughs> well, okay, maybe I'm not like everybody else. But Monday, this past Monday, was a day in which I woke up and I said, it's a beautiful day for a run. The heat and humidity had lifted. And I was actually up in the northern part of Pennsylvania. It was just a gorgeous morning. But I was actually not going to run uh, this uh, Monday. I was actually going to be bike riding. There were a group of high schoolers, and they were all going to be going on what is called a tempo run. And this is where you have to run not quite enough to kill yourself, but further than you really want to at that very fast pace. So they were going to do five six-minute miles. And the days of me doing a six-minute mile, especially more than one, have long passed. So I was going to be on my bike. And it was a gorgeous morning, and we were running along what Pennsylvanians call mountains, but really are just hills, kind of going into a a creek there. And uh, because it had just rained, there were lots of waterfalls kind of coming in, and there was the sort of the the mist in the morning that the sun was starting to, to burn off. And it was really, really beautiful. But for the, these senior boys that were running, I don't think they were really, um, they weren't so much soaking in the beauty of the moment, right? They were very much focused on their goals of leagues and districts and states and their breathing and their strides and kind of paying attention to where their body was hurting or where it felt good. So they were locked in there. But I, on my bike, again, was at a different uh, time in this season of my life, and I kind of rode with them, and at the end, I helped them. But I admit, I stayed behind a couple times and took some photos <laughs> along the way. A very different attitude I had towards the, the pacing uh, and, and sort of how we were thinking about our time there on that, that beautiful run. So I was thinking a lot about time, spending, uh, spending time with uh, these, these high schoolers in this cross-country camp. And uh, I open up my, my scripture the next morning to uh, read over the lessons for this Sunday. And I read the words of Paul to the Ephesians. And Paul, uh, this week, tells us to make the most of our time to be wise about how we, we choose to spend our time. In fact, the, the word he uses is, is from the word for to go to market. You know, like you kind of test a fruit or a vegetable to make sure that it smells and feels right. He's saying when you use your time, like test it out, think it through. I think for all of us, though, we're very much aware of the need to optimize, to use our time well. I think all of us have a a sense that our time is finite and that we only get this one holy and precious life once. In fact, there's a, a phrase in our culture that has become so popular of late, and that is YOLO. You only live once, YOLO. And this is often invoked when you want to push or encourage somebody to try something, you know, to go skydiving or to eat that extra Oreo or to take that extra day of vacation. You only live once, YOLO. And we know, too, this is a something that after COVID, I think many of us became really aware of our mortality. And we've seen so many people change jobs, change relationships, change locations, a sense of, hey, I only live once. And if I'm, if I'm not doing something that's bringing me happiness and joy, then, then what am I doing with this one holy and precious life that, that I have And there almost then becomes a little bit of tension then between a sort of an impulse to work and to play hard. And I feel like our our culture is kind of shifting away from working hard to wanting to play hard. In fact, we're just about to enter into the Hallmark movie season, right? Only a few more weeks till we'll get them. And we all know the basic plot, right? That there's a hardworking city dweller and a relaxed relational country dweller and they are going to meet and they're going to fall in love and the hardworking one has to discover the joy of playing hard as well, of 
relationships and so forth. So in our culture, I think we're thinking quite a bit about how we spend our time, how we use this one holy and precious life that, that we have. And again, I would say the, the zeitgeist, the feeling of our culture right now is to, to lean a little bit into indulgence and adventure. So is this what Paul is telling us? Is is this what the Apostle Paul, writing from prison to the congregation in Ephesus, is telling them? Hey, you only live once. Make the most of it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Doesn't seem like it. Paul's first line, in fact, right after he says to make use of the time, is to say, don't get drunk. Don't live a life of dissipation and debauchery. That somehow, even though life is short and finite, it's not simply about the indulgence of the self. There's something more. In fact, Paul is the one who who declares YOLO to be pagan. He says, look, if Jesus Christ isn't risen from the dead, then we are most of all to be pitied. And what we should be doing if Jesus isn't risen from the dead is eating, drinking, and being merry. Again, Paul knows what's going on here. And Paul is telling us to be wise about how we use our time. But he's, he's not commending us to simply do whatever feel good or do whatever our desires want to satiate them. No, he's calling us to something different. So what then is Paul calling us to, to simply sort of to put our nose to the grindstone and to work until our hands are worn away? Don't think that's what Paul is commending us to either. In fact, Paul says that what we're supposed to be doing with our time is praising God. Again, Paul says that what we're supposed to be doing with this one precious life that we've been given is to praise our Creator. Mm. Now, what then does Paul mean? Is Paul imagining then that at all times we should be gathered in in churches or synagogues or houses of worship and, and simply praising God in those dwellings? I don't think that either, for Paul says we're supposed to do this at all times. Paul's imagining, envisioning a life of praise that certainly is grounded in the communal act of worship, but somehow lives itself out in real life. So what does that mean for us to praise God when we're not in the sanctuary together? What does this look like for us to praise God at all times in our daily lives each and every awesome day? I'd like to go back to play and to work, but rather than set them in contrast, I'd, I'd like to say that I think, I'd, I'd offer, I'd suggest that The moments in life when we praise God outside of the walls or outside of sort of official acts of worship, the moments, the times when we are praising God is when our play has become our work and our work has become our play and the two are totally in sync. I think this is when, as Paul says, we begin to make melody in our hearts with our creator and redeemer. What I mean by this? Well, what I mean is, is that there is a certain way I, I think about those runners that day. And they were doing what young people should do, test and see what the body that God has given them, how far they can push it. The, the day before, just two days prior, I got to hear two of the, the graduating youth in our church make music. Got to see them just sort of lean in and figure out as young people what what they can do, what they can do with their instruments, in this case a flute, and of their voice. There's a certain way, again, in which we just discover life and see what, what is possible, and in so doing, our work and our play start to link up there. I think, too, about the task of of parenting and the job, say, of a father, the work of a father to love their children and the joy that comes then when a dad is able to embrace their child. 
Or when a, when a mom decides they, they want to teach their, their daughter how to play soccer. And again, that work and that play start to link up. Or when a teacher is teaching and they see the light bulb and the student go off. Or when a patient comes back for that, that check-in three weeks later and they actually did what you as a nurse or doctor told them to do. And they're better. And they're so thankful for your help and your medical guidance and training. Or when as a grandfather or grandmother, your, your grandchild's about to go off to college and you bless them and tell them that they're going to be fine and that they're on the right path. Again, there are times in life where the work, that which we're called to do, is also our play, our joy, our, our free room to kind of explore and to, to live and to love. And I think that's, again, when when life becomes an act of praise, when our, our play and our work begin to become one. And I believe in this way, actually, even people who don't worship God explicitly, I think when we get to that point in life, I do think all of us as humans are, are praising our Creator, doing what we're supposed to be doing and being filled and giving at the same time those are beautiful moments, beautiful times in life when we know we are spending our time the right way. But there are, there are plenty of times in life when play and work aren't aligned, where, where play and work aren't on the same page, where uh, the play has become dissipation, it's become pointless, it's become addictive. And there are times when the work of our hands gives us no joy. What do we do in life? What do we do in life when we, when we realize that our play and our work are, are two totally different spheres, that they're not overlapping, that we're having trouble bringing together acts of praise in our daily life? Well, this is where we, again, need to be perfectly clear that you only live once is not Christian. For us as Christians, we would have to modify it at the very least to you only live by grace. You only live by grace. And I think it's when we discover that our play and our work aren't aligned, this is where now our Christian faith and, and who Jesus is is going to come to the fore. For, for there are, are times in life, and I think there's, only a, there's a couple of reasons why our work and our play become disjointed. And the first, the first is simply because not all of life is fun. And not all of life is easy. The effortless music that we heard last Saturday in this church is the result of a lot of hours of practicing boring scales, getting them right. And the runners who I ran with, that wasn't their first run. They had done a whole lot of runs before they got to that point. And even one of them on the run was clearly having to, to deal with pain. Or I think about this task of parenting and, and passing on to the next generation an understanding of right and wrong. This is a core fundamental task, but, but I'm discovering on both ends of this equation, as a child and as a parent, that, that passing on of right and wrong often involves some tears. Not always easy conversations. I, too, think about times when, yes, there are people who are launching new ventures and uh, professionally, and they just don't have the resources, but they've got to slog through. Or when, for example, in our lives, we realize we have to care for a loved one, and it's not just because they have to stay home from school one day, but it's days, weeks, months, and that just wears on us. And we, we recognize there we need a power. We need a power that is greater than our own, a strength that is greater than our own. We need grace to come into our lives and supply what we lack. We, we need the one who has carried a cross, carried a cross, and knows what it's like to be pushed beyond. We need one who can grab our hand that is sinking, overwhelmed by life's burdens and the demands of being a disciple. Again, we only live by grace. 
grace that comes to us in Jesus. Sometimes the reason why our work and our play are disjointed is simply because we've messed up. We've made the wrong choices. We loved the wrong things or the wrong people. And we are now suffering the consequences of our actions. At this time, again, we discover that we only live by grace and that we need one who has not simply come to be our strength or our teacher, but one who has come to be our savior. We need one who has come to bear our sins in his body and offer us divine forgiveness. Again, we discover you only live by grace. But there are other times, too, where our work and our play aren't aligning, and that's actually the will of God. That God is telling us that it's time to start a new chapter. I'm amazed at, at how many of us, how many of us really get worried that we're going to make the wrong choice. And what astounds me is that I would think that older people would have more fear of this, recognizing their time was limited. But actually, younger people are becoming paralyzed by this in a world filled with so many options and possibilities. I see young person after young person struggle to make commitments, fear of heading in the wrong direction, of, of misspending this one holy and precious life that we have. But again, we only live by grace, and we need one who has conquered death who can tell us, well, no, you only die once, but you live more than once. One who has all the time in the world who can tell us it's okay to take a risk, it's okay to make a mistake, you've got all eternity to fix it. Again, we need the one who is risen from the dead. And so we, we live our lives and we savor and we come to church on a Sunday to give God thanks for those times when our work and our play were in line and our heart was making melody with God outside of these walls. But we, we come here, we come here to, to receive that fountain of grace, to receive the strength, the mercy, the forgiveness and resurrection that cannot come from ourselves, but comes from Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And then, like Paul, we discover that there is grace, a grace that is sufficient for us. Amen.